of Roaches Automotive for the past 20 years. His family, even longer. I've been in there almost every day for two or three months. So it's, I've left notes, I've left messages. Ryan says he had heard about Peter Roach's recent troubles and was trying to give the businessman some leeway. I have a big concern about my own family and my own transportation every day and the money I'm spending on transportation and the places myself, my wife and my kids can't get, can't get to as a result of him having my car still. Ryan says if he doesn't get his car fixed and return to him soon, he may seek legal advice. But he's not the only one having issues with Roach's automotive. Amy Hancock first spoke with CBC Investigates last month. She had also taken her car there for repairs in November. She finally got it back from Peter Roach a few weeks ago. About an hour later, everything was starting to go wrong with it again. The same problems I was having before. Hancock says she's frustrated. I was just disgusted. Um, I got, I've got two kids that I'm driving around with and I wanted the car back in running condition. Now his phone is not working. I can't reach him on his phone. The, uh, the shop is down. They're still not open for business. I can't, still can't get a hold of anybody again. So back to square one. Peter Roach was in provincial court today on an unrelated matter. He and his company pleaded not guilty to dozens of charges of faking school bus inspections. He'll go on trial this summer. Well, I spoke with Peter Roach at court today, and he told me a lot of the same information he told us last month, that he was involved in an accident and he's still in recovery. Now, he says a couple of employees will open Roach's Automotive tomorrow, and he's hoping to actually be back at work on Monday. He's also promising to reach out to Terry Ryan and Amy Hancock to fix their cars. Debbie? Thanks very much, Jen. Well, we have some pretty graphic photos to show you now. They are of a boy who was injured when a dog attacked him bit his face. Seven-year-old Talon Osmond from Stephenville was visiting his grandparents in La Poyle over Easter. His mom, Angie Colburn, says Talon was playing in a family friend's yard when a dog that was tied up attacked him. Colburn says the child of the family who owns the dog was hugging the pet, and when Talon went to do the same, the dog jumped up and bit him. Doctors say if the bite had been a half inch closer, Talon could have lost an eye or had his eyesight permanently damaged. Now, Talon's mom is warning parents to teach their children about pet safety. Even if you think you can trust the dog, don't. Um, you know, always watch for the signs that, especially the hair and, you know, the lips curling back or anything like that. Just making sure that even though you think you're playing, the dog might not. And just keeping close hands on them when you know they're going places with dogs as well. Well, a Supreme Court judge has ruled Nalcor is on the hook for almost a million dollars. The Crown Corporation has to pay TCE Capital Corporation $892,000 because it cancelled a contract for clearing land for transmission lines in Labrador. In October 2013, Nalcor cut its contract with Great Western Forestry. And that company was using money from TCE to pay its contractors and employees. After the company fell behind schedule, Nalcor refused to pay its final invoice. The judge ruled that Nalcor had no right to do that. To Lewisport now, where fast thinking and quick action helped save the life of a pet dog that fell through the ice. Unfortunately, a second dog that fell in could not be rescued in time. Here now is Chris Ensing has the story. The call came in just after 5 o'clock yesterday to the volunteer fire department. Two dogs were spotted on the ice somewhere behind me here and were in danger of falling into the water. Now, the volunteer fire department did respond to the call. They started to walk across the ice. That's when they realize it's not as stable as it seems. Slush running up past their ankles as they got onto a board to swim towards these two pets. Now, when they finally did reach the animals, here's what happened. And uh, we kind of just uh, went to the dog that was still doing pretty good, got that one out of the water. Uh, between air and the open water, we had the uh, our firefighter stationed along shore. We had him on the ice at certain points. So he come in and passed the dog on and changed over and he come on the shore with the other dog. Uh, then the, uh, the, the guy on, on our cold water rescue board went back into the water, went out and retrieved the second dog, uh, which they brought it to shore and passed it on to a cruise. A town manager was actually 
passing by who stopped and had helped perform CPR for 35 minutes on the pet until they realized that it was a lost cause and the pet had died. Now, with all of this happening, I asked the fire chief how it felt to see the reaction of the community for these two pets. Here's what he told me. Uh, as, like I said, I was out on the wharf and I was watching the crew. There was no hesitation. There was uh, six firemen dressed in minutes and put on the proper gear and out on the ice in different places. So it's, it's, a, it's a very proud thing in the back of your mind to keep that you've got such a dedicated group of guys that, you know, it's on call 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And with all of this, the fire chief is issuing a strong warning to residents in the community to stay away from the ice this time of the year, reminding them that it may look stable, but the spring thaw has definitely started and it is not safe to be walking across this ice. Chris Hensing, CBC News, Lewisport. Well, RCMP now confirm a fire that demolished a hardware store in Happy Valley Goose Bay was arson. The fire destroyed Motherwood Timber Mart and a neighboring warehouse early last Wednesday. Jacob Barker joins us now live. He's near what's left of those structures. Jacob? Yeah, well, after a week of sifting through what was left of Motherwood Timber Mart, police now believe that somebody uh, at least one individual entered the store, broke into the store illegally and set the fire intentionally, though police are not saying how they came to that conclusion. Now, last Wednesday, if we do go back, the fire completely consumed the building, leaving just a few supporting beams standing. It eventually spread to the warehouse next door and both buildings were complete losses. The major crimes unit from St. John's came in Monday to assist the local RCMP for a forensic investigation is still ongoing here and RCMP say they have been interviewing people in the community as well. The property was up for sale just under $4.5 million. Owner Morris Hill told the CBC his family was devastated and that the shop employed about 16 people in the community. Police wouldn't say if there was if they suspect more than one person in the alleged arson, but they did confirm that some people have come forward with information from the public. Anything at all that uh, in relation to that location and uh, that particular uh, criminal act, absolutely come forward. Uh, no matter how small that information may be, it could be uh, something that we could uh, utilize at a later date during the investigation. Now, the owner was out of town, but he did tell the CBC that he met with RCMP yesterday, though he said he was not aware of this alleged arson until we reached him this afternoon. Reporting live for here and now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. Well, as if transatlantic shipping isn't difficult enough off our coasts, in the past month, it's become even more challenging. A late March storm that brought hurricane force winds is the culprit, and that's meant a sudden and significant jump in the number of icebergs in the shipping lanes off our coasts. Here now, Cease Hare has been looking into this, and he's joining us now live. Cease? Thank you very much, Debbie. This time last week, last Wednesday, I was down here at the Narrows and uh, the Narrows were blocked with sea ice. Today, it's a completely different story. And that's the way it is with ice. One day it's there, the next day it's not. The same thing happened to the International Ice Patrol in March. They were predicting a light season for icebergs. They had counted 37. And after that fierce windstorm in March, there were 455. The American Coast Guard's Super Hercules took off again this morning from St. John's for another day on the job, flying over the Atlantic. They've been making surveillance flights since February around Newfoundland and will do so until July. The primary job of the International Ice Patrol that was set up after the sinking of the Titanic is to alert shipping companies of the presence of icebergs in shipping lanes between Europe and North America. I've been doing this for almost a decade uh, with the Ice Patrol and the significant change in the season is something that I have not experienced before. Commander McGraw says things are improving around the three offshore oil rigs and in the area where the Titanic sank 105 years ago. But the last 30 days just hasn't been the same in the Atlantic with all that ice. When the ships have to divert their track, they have to go about 
400, 500 miles out of their way to go around that iceberg limit that we're producing to warn them of that dangerous area. So it has had an impact. It has had an effect. I mean. It definitely has. McGraw says for now there are about 300 bergs drifting down the Labrador current. Where they end up is anyone's guess. For now, the winds are pushing them westward, away from the island and international shipping lanes. But that could change. That's very hard to say. And again, you know, with hap what happened over the last month, I'm kind of <laughs> cautious to give a prediction because it could change pretty quickly. Well, uh, things have gotten a little bit better. There's no doubt about that in the last couple of days. For example, uh, the iceberg limit, that's the danger area that ships are told to avoid altogether. Now, yesterday, the iceberg limit went all the way south past where the Titanic sank. But that has changed as of today uh, because there are no bergs in the area. The iceberg limit has moved a little north, about two, 220 kilometers north. Cease here, CBC News, Prosser's Rock. Well, the minimum price for the 2017 spring shrimp fishery was set this week, and it's not good news for harvesters. The price setting panel decided on 95 cents a pound. The panel has only two options to choose from. The suggested price put forward by the FFAW, which was $1.45, or the one they chose, which was submitted by the Association of Seafood Producers. The panel says prices are down across the globe. In the past two years, DFO has made dramatic cuts to the shrimp quota. Memorial University will be getting its brand new science building after all, the university announced today the main construction contract has been awarded. Now, last year, all the bids the university received were more than 5% above the estimated costs, and that delayed the project by over a year. The new facility is now set to open in 2020. The total budget for the new facility is $325 million. The federal government will contribute just shy of $100 million. And the province will kick in 25 million. For its part, Mun will get 25 million of the Memorial University Matching Fund, and it will borrow 175 million dollars. Well, now to a story about some people who are remembering through knitting. A group of women on the West Coast has knitted their way back in time to recreate war socks from the First World War. Now they're sending those wool socks to soldiers who are deployed. Here now is Colleen Connors tells us more about this project. It started with an idea and some rough yarn. Avid knitters in Cornerbrook thought it would be nice to knit socks for Newfoundland and Labrador soldiers who were deployed overseas. But these socks have a story. During the First World War, the Women's Patriotic Association knitted over 60,000 pairs of these socks for troops fighting in the war. A hundred years later, these socks do more than keep soldiers' feet warm. It means quite a lot. There's a lot of history. Uh, from uh, all the volunteers even back then, over 100 years ago. So, and now they're making it alive again. Smith doesn't plan on wearing his. He wants to frame them and keep the pair with other war memorabilia. More than 20 women knitted 66 pairs of wool socks, following the exact archival pattern from 1914. Today, they were celebrated for their hard work, most of the pairs were shipped in care packages to local soldiers deployed in places like Kosovo and Afghanistan. All the hard work was done here at the Cornerbrook Museum. Knitters worked with the rough wool, adjusting the length and reinforcing the toe. For Ricky Murley, this is more than a hobby. This pin was given to my grandmother back in the First World War. She knit socks for the soldiers back then. Murley and her fellow knitters heard about the Socks for Soldiers project and signed up. She brought along her grandmother's pin. I said, well, if my grandmother did it, I can do it as well. The commemorative knitting program is not done quite yet. More care packages will be sent to deployed soldiers from here on Canada Day with lots of Newfoundland goodies and a pair of homemade wool socks. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Coming up, we'll tell you about a running club whose coaches are weeks away from having babies. But that has not slowed them down.
And later we'll take you to Holy Heart Theater in St. John's where the Newfoundland Symphony Theater got to perform today with some of the finest musicians in the world. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. And time for a little uh, weather checkup now. Lots to talk about, but before we get there, remember six weeks back when we were hit with that ferocious windstorm here on the East Coast? Well, tonight, there's a dollar figure attached to all of that damage. Oh, who doesn't remember this? In mid-March, that windstorm ripped down power lines, knocked out electricity to tens of thousands of homes and businesses. Yes, it tore off roofs, ripped away siding from homes, damaged vehicles, even toppled dozens of traffic lights in St. John's. And of course, in some places, the winds blowing upwards of 180 kilometers per hour, while sustained winds were clocked at 110. Uh, tonight, the Insurance Bureau of Canada tells us that the damage from that storm adds up to almost $45 million. Wow. Yeah, bit of a price tag on that. For so, sure. Uh, no wind like that in the forecast, good. which is good, but uh, we do have some freezing rain that could be significant in central parts of Newfoundland. By the looks of things right now, it will be significant. Anywhere from the Bonavista Bay area through Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor, Back across to Cornerbrook, Grossmorn, and the Deer Lake uh, 
region also up as far north as the Daniels Harbor region. Uh, these are the areas that are expected to be into that significant icing. There's also a rainfall warning in effect for Bay St. George, Cornerbrook and Grossmorn uh, because we'll see some rain closer to areas of the coastline and that rain tonight uh, will be in the upwards of 20, 30, even 40 millimeter range. And then it's the mix to freezing rain tomorrow and the icing on top of that. And that icing again will really take uh, hold tomorrow across central as temperatures drop. Again, we're talking, I think, about 10 to 20 millimeters here of rain with the temperatures at or below the freezing mark. So upwards of 10 to 20 millimeters of ice accretion possible here uh, anywhere from, again, Bonavista Bay back towards the Humber Valley, Cornerbrook and areas right along the west coast, I think will be a little bit less. But again, significant icing certainly possible here for all of those areas under that freezing rain warning. And this is why two systems uh, that are going to be funneling up moisture into our neck of the woods and are already doing so with the clouds and uh, those showers already starting to push in to western Newfoundland. Along this frontal boundary where all the precip is going to be north of it, we've got snow, ice pellets and freezing rain to the south of it. We've got the periods of rain, the showers and the drizzle and where that frontal boundary sets up tomorrow is going to be key. But there's some pretty good consensus that for Thursday afternoon, it does dip into the Bonavista Bay area south of central back towards the Cornerbrook region area south of this are going to be seeing the mild temperatures areas along and north of that is are where we're going to be seeing that icing and that will continue for Thursday night and into Friday morning before that front finally lifts north as this area of high pressure breaks down a little bit and allows that southerly wind to kick in with everybody warming up as we move into the Friday time period. So when we wake up tomorrow morning, it's actually going to be quite mild. Uh, even Cornerbrook and Central, three, four degrees. We'll start near three or four in St. John's as well and as warm as five degrees on the south coast. Note the cold air on the other side of this front talking about starting the day in minus 14 to 16 range for inland parts of Labrador and minus five for the Northern Peninsula and the Straits. So uh, we'll actually peak near 11 degrees in St. John's around lunchtime to early afternoon. The winds will then shift to north and will drop back to near freezing by this time tomorrow. And we'll have that risk of some freezing drizzle uh, for St. John's for a handful of hours for tomorrow evening and then the winds will shift back to southerly and we'll see the return of the warm air for Friday. So uh, breakdown for region by region, southwest winds in the morning will shift to north and again those double digit temperatures will fall and even the single high single digit temperatures for Clarenville Bonavista will fall into the afternoon with freezing rain there. We'll remain in the southerly winds with showers, drizzle and fog through the day along the south coast. Those periods of rain in central wind shift to northerly and these are your temperatures for most of the day tomorrow, minus one to minus four. And again, that significant freezing rain through the day. The west coast again starting mild. Uh, winds will shift to east and northeasterly. Uh, freezing rain, Cornerbrook, Grossmorn and Humber Valley. And six and seven degrees for Stephenville to Port of Port and down towards the Port of Basque region. For the northern peninsula, southeastern Labrador will actually remain uh, bright tomorrow. Uh, flurries remaining for St. Anthony and the Straits in that uh, ice pellet mix for port -a -Chois. It's a beautiful day along the north coast of Labrador and that snow will crawl into western parts of Labrador with increasing clouds and a few flurries in Churchill Falls staying dry in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Long range details are still ahead, Carolyn. Thanks, Ryan. Well, a new running group in St. John's is seeing a rise in membership, including two participants who haven't even been born yet. Two of the coaches leading the way for a Lululemon Tele 10 training clinic are keeping the pace while pregnant. Here now's Jeremy Eaton has their story. Only another 87 days until the 90th running of the Tele 10 and thousands of people struggling to make it here to the finish line. Now at this time of year, lots of running groups offer up programs to help people get through the 16 kilometer course. Now one of the newest groups can boast one of the greatest Tele 10 runners as their coach. This year, Lululemon here in St. John's started a new practice squad. There is such a big opportunity in Newfoundland with run clubs, um, Tele 10 being such a big thing here. So we wanted to create an opportunity that was complimentary for all runners, whether it's starting out or super advanced. But this group is a little different. There's no charge, no registration fee, no experience required. They also brought in a heavy hitter as the coach, Kate Baisley. She's the reigning Tele 10 champion and can boast the fastest time ever run by a female in the race. I obviously have like a passion for running and training and 
you know, the local running scene and that. So it's been good to sort of like dip, dip my feet into it. And um, I'm hoping to actually, you know, maybe start coaching one day or something like that. I couldn't think of a better runner in the community to have. And so as soon as she came to us, I was like, let's do this. And then when you found out she was pregnant, did that deter you at all? <laughs> no, it didn't, because I'm also pregnant, so I thought, this is great. <laughs> and nothing, not even pregnancy, is slowing these runners down. Not really, because I can, you know, make the program that I think can, you know, suit most people and uh, help coach and kind of motivate and offer advice and answer questions and stuff like that, and then kind of be out there when they're doing runs and stuff? I think to be honest it's inspiring for a lot of people um, and I think it's uh, yeah I think it's just inspiring and it, it just shows that you can run at any stage and any time in your life. And that's the message. This group is open to anyone who's willing to lace up and hit the streets whether you're running just for yourself or you're running for two. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. After the break, a Labrador trapper takes us off the beaten path to experience his way of life.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, for trappers in central Labrador, martin pelts are considered a prized catch and can fetch high prices at an auction. But it isn't just about the money. For trappers like William Mark Larkham Jr., it's a part of his history and heritage. And he shows that through his YouTube videos that have thousands of people watching. Well, Here and Now's Jacob Barker caught up with Larkham on his trap line just off the Trans-Labrador Highway right before Martin's season ended and before the snow began to melt. This is all pretty untouched Labrador wilderness, really. So this is the, the last trap line I'm going to use for the year. And, uh, and anyway, we'll go in and uh, I tailed up a few days ago, see if we get anything. Trapping is a tradition that goes back hundreds of years here in Labrador and growing up in a small community, you know, there's not a whole lot to do really. Here to hit off here for bait, the hit of a spruce grouse. And you know, uh, Martin's they hunt uh, spruce grouse, so you know, the, the same kind of food they're used to eating, so when he sees that, he'll be licking his lips. And they just took the springs and just took them in the box there. So our great great grandmother, she was actually a, a full breed Inuit, and and that's where it come from there and down through my grandmother's line, right? And you know, like we always was strong in culture, but I think at a young age you really don't know that. It's only when you get older you realize how really how important culture is. It, it kind of evolves as you get older, especially when you got kids. Then you really see it. This here is a a weasel. It's not what we're after. We like to get a marten, but like you know, you're not going to get rich trapping, so. Every dollar counts. The main occupation is fishing, you know, but uh, but you get a nice bonus some years from trapping. But I actually got a, a Merton nesting box, and I, I'm going to put in here now, and hopefully uh, Mertons will nest in it and use them. <laughs> no way. Now that's a blooper. And have some babies there, and the babies yeah. grow up, and maybe you'll catch a few of them. Hopefully they'll have a breed and with a box together give a good chance that uh, a lot of them will survive. Like a lot of trappers say before, you know, if the pelts are a dollar, they'll still trap because it's in, it's in your blood. And, and you know, when you're at your trap line out and you know, you could haul 50 traps and not get in there catch. But you know, before you approach the next trap, you're, you're kind of excited because it could, that could be the trap you got to catch in. There's always that anticipation. I said there's a Martin box right there, nothing in it. To keep your drive going, right? We got a Martin. <laughs> Thank goodness. Oh, look at that. Nice, you know, nice dark brown. Uh, yeah, probably a select pelt. So that's above average Martin there. He'll do well in the auction. And that's what he calls a nice suitcase catch, double jab, so nice humane catch. You're putting down, you know, you're wrapping up like a little baby, you know, and look after him. Just, just so. You, you travel along and chafe a little bit of fur off, and then select pelt's gone, just like that. You're down to a number one, and and you know, it could be take twenty, thirty dollars worth of the value of the pelt just like that. I do run a YouTube channel. To me, it's still another large day here in the big land, and got something a little special going on today. Uh, uh, I got D. Jacob Barker, CBC News here, <laughs> and he's been chasing me around all day. I'm not really sure what he's up to. We'll have to, to wait and see. I didn't know how to edit. I, you know, if I if I didn't get a perfect shot when I hit start to when I stop. Stop that bit of footage. If it didn't come out just right, I, I wouldn't upload it. And trapping, you know, usually a big hit. And uh, sealing, sometimes yeah. for the wrong reason, sealing videos, <laughs> you get a lot of hits. So it happens to the best of us. Uh, I'm sure around 400 videos or so out now, and I feel like I only touched the tip of the iceberg. There's a there's endless material, really. And there's, you know, there's a lot of cultures around the world, and I just want to put hours out there so, so the rest of the world could see it and understand. You know, a little more about Labrador, really, because there's not, very little known to Labrador, outside of Labrador, really. I took my buddy out and we haven't gotten near a rabbit. Uh, and I want to pass it along. I want to see my young fellow take over the trap line. When he gets older, I'll go along with him and teaching and stuff. Okay, so you want to use some carrots for bait. And the rabbits will come meet the carrots and we'll get to catch them in their snares. Yes, I want to use a rabbit. Okay, so we're using birch here now. Uh, I think but the way this with culture now is well, you just can't live the old lifestyle, but you, there's got to be a blend of both. And that is a really good idea, guys. We'll have a boil up around here somewhere too. I, I think it would be a good thing that if people could understand what you're doing, like and accept it, like 
Because like people, just as soon as you show a seal hunting video or, or a trapping video, you know, they might come out with a nasty comment. But if they come and understand why you're doing it, it's for food or fur for clothing and things like that. And I'm sure there's something, you know, in their lives that you could probably pick apart. <laughs> I might take the lives of some animals, but the environment's not being damaged. But you, you could be over there, you know, uh, be a nice little piece of forest and you flatten and put pavement down and, and put a subdivision in a house and think there's nothing wrong with that, but, but 20 years ago there was moose and deer living there and they don't think there's nothing wrong with that. So you gotta look at, look at the overall picture of what's going on. And, and I, I think to leave the environment intact like this and the harvest from it is the best thing there is and that's the way it really was meant to be. Well, after the break, the Coast Guard takes us on an aerial tour of Notre Dame Bay for a close-up view of the ice clogging the coast coastline. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, pack ice off the northeast coast of the island is causing a lot of problems for ferries, fishing vessels, and the Coast Guard. Icebreakers are busy trying to get traffic moving and in some cases freeing ships lodged in the ice. Earlier today, I spoke with the superintendent of ice operations with the Coast Guard to find out what they're seeing offshore. We've been fortunate enough that uh, some of the ice we saw on the east coast of Newfoundland has uh, cleared away a little bit. Uh, on the northeast uh, coast, however, things aren't quite so clear. We have a large pack of ice uh, came down from Labrador, is filled up into Notre Dame Bay, and the whole northeast coast is full of ice. So we're experiencing probably 30 to 40 miles worth of pack ice for, for most communities to be able to get out and do open water. Wow. And how does that amount of ice compare to past years? So we're sort of on par for uh, what we've seen over the last, say, 20 years. The averaging is coming in. It's in some new areas that we haven't seen a lot of before coming down to the East Coast. Normally, it's generally in the Northeast Coast this time of year as well. And what kind of problems uh, does the ice cause? So the problems with the ice that uh, we're experiencing are there's a lot of people anxious to get out fishing, start making money for that season. So uh, some people are getting anxious coming out into the ice, you know, probably a little prematurely and it results in them getting stuck and sort of takes away our resources now. We have to go and free up some ships. You can see uh, when the ice gets pushed by the wind, it creates pressure on the ice and you can see some of the, uh, the ships come up on the ice pans you know, and they can't move anywhere. So we need to bring in somebody else to help them out. 
So that same thing happens with the, uh, the ferries and other uh, situations up in the northeast coast. So ideally we'd have the, uh, the ferries running every day and be uh, no smooth sailing. But uh, when people get themselves in trouble, they can turn into search and rescue calls and it takes our resources away. So. Are you getting many calls right now? Uh, the Rescue Coordination Centre takes all the search and rescue calls, so they're dealing with those. We're getting a few uh, ice taskings. It's always a balance of when something switches between ice and search and rescue. So if anyone's in any imminent danger, we always appeal to them to you know, call search and rescue when they can, like you know, get an early start on it. The ice taskings, we try and do some preventative stuff, but uh, mostly we're doing our priorities running the ice program for the uh, Canadian government. How do you handle the rescue of a fishing vessel? What do you do when you get out there? So generally our icebreakers will uh, get on scene, assess the situation and determine the safest way to, uh, to go about it. There's a lot of unique situations that, uh, that will happen. Uh, this is more of a search and rescue call, but uh, generally the ones we're experiencing with the fishing vessels, uh, they're pinned up in the ice and starting, you know, sometimes if it progresses, they could be taking on water, be drifting towards shore. So basically our icebreaker will get close enough to relieve the pressure on that ice so that they'll flop back down into the water and hopefully they can uh, steer them out towards safer waters. So I guess your vessels are pretty busy right now. Yes indeed, yeah, we have uh, all of our icebreakers are out uh, that we can put up there. We have uh, one dedicated uh, to the uh, northeast coast, one on the east coast and one on the uh, west coast, Straits of Belle Isle. And what would your message be to all of those anxious fish harvesters out there? Yeah, the uh, good message for fishermen right now is to uh, have a look at the overall ice pack before you set out. We've had some southwest and southerly winds the last couple of days which have pushed the ice off of the land a little bit. So although it might look like uh, open water in your communities, you can see that once you get out so far you'll have another 40 miles of ice to contend with which is not uh, the best situation. Yeah, so just because conditions look good from the shoreline doesn't mean that once you get out there things can won't turn bad quickly. Exactly, and we're always about a good message of safety, so we're trying to keep everyone safe. So if you're in port safe and sound, it's a good spot to stay. And if you're out of the ice pack, out in open water, your best bet's to try and stay there. Uh, don't try and get back to your community. Maybe try another one where you could offload. Is there any way to predict how much longer fish harvesters are going to have to wait before it's really safe to go out on the water? Unfortunately, it's not something we can predict. It all has to do with the, the wind and the weather and the waves. and. Uh, many factors at, at play here, so we're hoping to keep some westerly southwest winds to clear off the, uh, the ice from the northeast coast over the next uh, week or two. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, some great stuff there. Yeah. Great job, Stokesy, uh, with that. And southwest westerly winds, he was talking about those. Not going to mm -hmm. see that tomorrow uh, for the northeast coast and along that north coast where it is packed in. But Friday into Saturday, we will get some favorable winds that uh, hopefully will shift things out a little bit. Here's how it's going to play out for your long range forecast. We'll start with the warnings that are again in place. Significant icing possible from Bonavista Bay through Central right across to Cornerbrook, Grossmorn and Daniels Harbor, though the West Coast is under the rainfall warning primarily for tonight from the port of port uh, for Cornerbrook and Grossmorn. That rain will continue tomorrow, but again, as temperatures drop, it becomes a freezing rain issue for Cornerbrook in the West. We are looking at upwards of 20 to 40 millimeters for that West Coast under that rainfall warning. Generally 10 to 20 millimeters for central Bonavista Bay and again back across to the Daniels Harbor region and again much of this looking set to fall as freezing rain and again as we uh, roll through your future tracker timeline again note that the winds will go from uh, southerly in the morning to northerly and that is what will set up that freezing rain for tomorrow afternoon from that stretch through much of Newfoundland uh, for the Avalon. We will shift to northerly winds here as well, but not until the afternoon and it will be uh, uh, just a slight risk of some patchy freezing drizzle into the late afternoon through the evening hours and then the southerly winds return for Thursday night. Before we switch over to those uh, northerly winds will peak near 11 degrees for tomorrow. Uh, temperatures for most of the day will be at or below zero for central over towards Cornerbrook. And again, the south coast will stay in those southerly winds with showers, drizzle and fog patches for the northern peninsula. Snow tonight 
to flurries and then it's a bit of a break and then the freezing rain returns tomorrow night. The Straits and up through Mary's Harbor, Cartwright looking pretty quiet tomorrow as is Happy Valley Goose Bay. Snow rolling back into Labrador City with some ice pellets and it's again as this frontal boundary moves back to the north and Happy Valley Goose Bay will get into some flurries freezing drizzle and then over to showers through the day on Friday and note that this frontal boundary goes northward slowly but surely as we roll through into the Friday afternoon and evening time period and then the warm air really starts to surge in on Saturday with a southerly wind that will be favorable for hopefully shifting some of that pack ice. Here is how your forecast plays out then for the next three days. Uh, we're looking at showers, cloud cover dominating on Friday and yes that freezing rain to showers across central parts of Newfoundland uh, showers uh, pretty frequent in eastern parts of Newfoundland. The chance of anyway clouds dominating now for Saturday. Scattered showers still on the menu across the island. Clouds I think dominate in the west, but looking more and more like we'll see a chance of some sunshine breaking through, which should help temperatures into the 12 to 14 degree range. Uh, yes, scattered showers in that mix, but uh, overall not half bad for Saturday right now. The winds will then shift back to northerly for Sunday, northwesterly. That'll have temperatures falling and a risk of some flurries mixing in. Though Labrador still looking quiet but cool on Sunday. And a quick look at that uh, seven day trend shows that Monday, Tuesday into Wednesday, looking around seasonal for this time of year, the five, six degree range. And in Labrador, riding the freezing mark into next week. It is time now to meet our young athlete of the day who enjoys softball and soccer, but his favorite sport to play is hockey. Noah Nolan is six years old and comes to us from Marystown. Yes, you met Noah's eight-year-old brother Nathan last night on our program. They are both big hockey fans, and Noah plays the forward position for the Marystown Mariners. Congratulations, Noah, on being chosen as today's young athlete of the day. After the break, we'll take you to a high school in St. John's where a violinist who is considered to be one of the best in the world performed today with the Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra. Welcome back to Here and Now. 
The National Arts Centre Orchestra is in St. John's this week to kick off a cross-Canada tour. The Canada 150 Tour is hosting its main show tomorrow night at the Arts and Culture Centre, a show that will feature Canadian violinist James Ennis. But the orchestra has lots of events planned before that. Today, its members teamed up with the Newfoundland Symphony Youth Orchestra for a concert at Holy Heart Theatre. Here and now is Jeremy Eaton has that story. We're very pleased and proud to share our facilities and venue with this side-by-side -side concert of the National Arts Centre Orchestra and the Newfoundland Symphony Youth Orchestra. Well, I'm here with the National Arts Centre Orchestra. I'm a member, I play the second clarinet and bass clarinet. Um, we're on tour right now doing a nationwide tour in celebration of Canada's 150th birthday. So the first stop is here in St. John's and uh, it's kind of fitting that I think the last province to join is the first that gets to start the tour. A really nice uh, collaboration with the uh, musicians of the National Arts Centre Orchestra with uh, the young musicians here from the uh, Sistema program um, and uh, we're working with Dwayne Andrews, sort of a local uh, music hero and someone I've been really looking forward to, uh, to getting to know. I'm playing a piece that he wrote. Um, so yeah, it's a nice, a nice chance to interact with the, the young people and um, you know, hopefully they can learn something from us and we'll probably learn something from them. Well, it's great. I, I, I've gotten to know Dwayne over the last year. I play in another group called Spectralite that's based out of St. John's, and uh, he's been working with us collaborating on writing some music lately. It's great to work with him. He's got such great perspectives on music, and he's got a really great original voice that is a lot of fun to, to play. It's For me, it's this, has been, this is actually really challenging because I'm not a fiddle player, obviously. I play the clarinet, but he's written a fiddle part into the clarinet, so I, I basically have nowhere to breathe, and I have to move my fingers like a fiddle player would. <laughs> Well, he got plenty of attention when he entered the Conservative leadership race, but today Kevin O'Leary announced he's dropping out. The truth about Canadian politics, and I don't have to tell you this, you people follow it, look at how many times Quebec has determined the federal outcome in elections in this country. It is the Florida of Canada. It often decides for the country for the very reason it has 78 ridings. You have to have some path to being successful there. I looked at the probability, I felt it was low. A successful businessman known for his role in the popular CBC show Dragon's Den, O'Leary had no history in the Conservative Party or as a politician. He also didn't speak French very well Mexico and his leadership campaign didn't gain much traction in Quebec. I think it's the right thing for the country and I think the probability of success of well, a frightening scene unfolded in Toronto early this morning. A Toronto firefighter had to use alpine rescue techniques to save a woman stuck high atop a construction crane. The rescue gripped the city, raising many more questions than answers. Ron Charles reports. In the early morning light, high above a downtown Toronto construction site, this. A lone figure, a woman, standing on the block of a 12-story crane swaying in the wind. How or why she got there is a mystery. When police and firefighters arrived, it became clear just how difficult her ascent must have been. An officer and a firefighter began the taxing climb. The woman on the crane took a seat. The hook that she's sitting on, the plan is for us to get a uh, firefighter over there, get her in a harness, the two of them harness, secure to that hook, and then the operator will slowly lower it, swing it over to the park, and then slowly lower it down. Acting Fire Captain Rob Wunfer, a trained technical rescuer, was lowered to the woman to attach her to his harness. It seemed too risky to lower the crane. Instead, they came down on rescue ropes to applause from spectators. <laughs> Police promptly handcuffed the woman and led her to paramedics. They put her on a stretcher and took her to the hospital for evaluation. 
In the more than two hours one first spent rescuing the woman, he says he concentrated on the job at hand, not her motives. We didn't talk that much. We just stay focused on, on the rescue, right? So I just want to make sure she was safe. She talked to me to make sure I was safe, and that's, uh, that's all we really said to each other, and just, you know, let's get out of this together. Police charged the woman with mischief-related offences. She'll remain in custody until a court appearance tomorrow. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Well, incredible new research out of Philadelphia that could mean hope for premature babies fighting for their lives. This is a fetal lamb being kept alive inside a plastic sack meant to mimic a mother's uterus. The lamb has managed to survive four weeks inside the artificial womb. Now the big question, of course, is whether it can help premature human babies. Researchers say human trials may be possible in a few years. Newborn bison have returned to the wild in Banff. The new calves are hugely significant because it's been 140 years since any have been born in the park. Parks Canada calls it a huge step in their bison reintroduction mission. Three calves have been born so far and seven more expected soon. The project aims to reestablish indigenous connections to the bison and the park. Hmm. Well, could this be the new way we commute to work? That would be cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it will be if uh, the big tech companies have their way. This is the Kitty Hawk Flyer. It weighs about 100 kilos and has eight battery powered propellers. Google co-founder Larry Page has the big bucks behind it and it could be on the market by the end of the year. Oh, wow. wow. Neat. Can't wait till the price goes down. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a while, I'd say. That almost looks like Newfoundland behind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. It's kind of like the Jetsons. <laughs> yeah. Go to work on one yeah, of those. It'd be like basically riding a drone to work. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that is so cool. I definitely want one of those. <laughs> Let's all chip in and get one. Uh, okay, tomorrow, 
Temperatures really dropping again in central. We'll get to double digits in St. John's, but winds shift to north into the afternoon. Uh, and again, Corner Brook in the west coast uh, will be uh, also under that freezing rain warning for tomorrow. And it's Pasadena oh. where <laughs> Robin Dimmer and her family are waiting for the big melt. And Come on, waiting oh. and waiting. Yeah, that little one isn't going anywhere. <laughs> that, but we are. Yes. See you all tomorrow. Good night, everyone.